Chapter One of the Arizona Callahan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Brandon. The Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien, Bedford Jones, Section One. Nellie Callahan was the only one to see just what happened everyone else in camp had gone down the island that day to get account of the half wild cattle among the blueberry swamps the wild drive of rain and low clouds to the westward hid garden island from sight and lowered all the horizon until lake michigan seemed a small place beaver island was clear vanished and so was high island with its colony of israelites nothing was to be seen from this north end of hog island except the foaming shallows and the deeper water beyond and the huge rollers bursting in from the wisconsin shore with two other things one as the keen blue eyes of the watching girl could make out was or had been a boat the other was a man she had heard shots faint reports cracking down the wind drawing her to the point of land to see what was happening out there toward garden island for a long while there was nothing to see until the boat came into sight it was only a blotch rising and then gone again gradually sinking from sight altogether few would have seen it nelly callahan however was an island girl and her eye was instantly caught by anything outside the settled scheme of things so she knew it for a boat and after a time knew that it had gone down entirely presently she made out the man to her intense astonishment he was sitting on the stern of a canoe and paddling canoes are rare things in the beaver islands these days here in the center of lake michigan with the nearest land little more than a mirage above the horizon there are other and safer playthings and life is too bitter hard to be lightly held yet here was a canoe driving down the storm a rag of sail on a stumpy mast ford tarpaulins lashed over freight rolls amidships the man paddling in the stern what connection was there between him and that sunken boat and those shots behind the curtain of rain and mist that he was trying to get in under the curving line of exposed ledge and shoal that ran out from the point was obvious if he missed he would be carried on out to the open lake for once around the point his chances of getting to land were slim nelly callahan watched him admiringly as he fought gaining inch by inch now leaning hard on his paddle now stroking desperately as the gusty wind threw off the canoe's head the odds were worse than he could realize too all along the point there were shoals running about two to three feet of water and his canoe evidently carried a centerboard suddenly she saw the paddle snap in his hands the canoe swayed wildly over swayed back again rose on a sweeping foam crest and was flung forward another instant and she would have been rolled over but the man snatched out another paddle and dug it in again the stubborn straining fight but he had lost ground and the current was setting out around the point of land still he had a good chance to win he was closer now nelly callahan could see that his shirt was torn to ribbons that his mouth was bleeding and those things did not come from wind and rain alone the canoe was a wide lake cruiser safe enough in any sea except for her heavy load but this rock-studded shore water was safe for no craft all the wide expanse around the beavers is treacherous with rocks barely awash an invisible hand seemed to strike the man suddenly knocking him forward on his face the canoe staggered lay over on one side she had struck bottom frantically the man recovered jerked up the centerboard 
threw in the pin but he was too late he had lost the game the bow with its scrap of sail bore off before the sweep of wind and like an arrow the canoe darted out around the point and was gone for a moment nelly callahan stood motionless at the edge of the trees then she turned and started to cut across the base of the long point to get a view of the north shore beyond there was no sail however nobody lived on hog island the brush was heavy and almost impenetrable excited breathless the girl struggled on her way but knew that she was too slow however she kept on presently she burst through the final barrier her feet slipping and sliding on the ground pine that trailed across the sand and came out on the northern stretch of shore nothing was in sight for a little while she stood there dismayed agonized incredulous she had been a long while getting here of course yet some sign of man or canoe even had the latter capsized must have been within sight here around the point the force of the rollers was lessened too yet everything was empty man and canoe had vanished a shout roused the girl she glanced over her shoulder fear flitting into her blue eyes then she turned and retraced her steps when she stepped back into the clearing of the camp the others had returned she shrank within herself slightly as always as her eyes swept them for though nelly was a beaver girl she was also something more her mother had come from the mainland and there was none of the closely interbred strain in nelly callahan where you been called matt big mary her father combing out his tangle of black beard with knotted fingers get the coffee on girl it's needin it we are the day it was something of a tribute to matt callahan that he was not known by the usual island diminutive though the peculiar system of nomenclature obtained to distinguish him from his cousin matty bassett callahan he was a giant of a man massive as an oak in his deep eyes a brooding glooming shadow that had lain there since his wife died the others were merry enough however for huey dunlevy had fallen into the swamp and mired himself head over ears small wonder that jimmy bassett and willie tom gallagher made sport at that since huey dunlevy was a great man on the island holding a second mate's ticket and strong as any two men except matt big mary he was fishing this summer going partners with matt and had bought a half interest in the callahan cattle that ran here on hog island men said in st james that he would make a good son-in-law to matt for it is always the wildest who settle down the best and if he would but leave jimmy bassett's moonshine liquor alone he had a great future fronting him here for a week they were pulling the long stakes that had held pound nets all the spring out at the edge of deep water where the great trout and whitefish ran and working the north island shore with trap nets and bloater lines here for a week were the four men with nelly callahan to cook and mine camp she and her father occupied the old shanty at the edge of the clearing the other three slept in the brown tent nearby now any other beaver girl would have at once drawn general attention to the sunken boat which would wash in and make salvage and to the presumably drowned man and his canoe but nelly callahan kept quiet she had become a changed girl since getting home from her school teaching this spring and finding that her father had made a match with huey dunlevy for her much had happened sorrowful things had transpired and nelly callahan was biding her time half an hour passed by and the noon meal was over and since the weather was too bad for work there was naught to be done but sit and smoke then matt big mary took jimmy bassett and willie tom gallagher with him at a trap net from the big launch dragged up under the trees 
and set off down the shore he gave huey dunlevy a significant wink we'll take the skiff down to belmore bay said he and be setting a trap out beyond the old wreck and maybe pick up a fifty dollar box of bass come saturday huey my lad keep your eye on the camp ay said big huey grinning all over his broad good-natured face and they filed off down the shore on their two-mile tramp to belmore bay nelly was keenly aware of the strategy but made no comment she was afraid of huey as well she might be a fine strappin lad he was except when he was crossed and good-natured while he had his own way and there was no liquor in him yet he was one to be afraid of there's more cattle down the island than we look for nelly said he chewing at a cigar and watching the girl she cleaned up the buyer will be over from east jordan next week and then there'll be doin's what's more there's been some big pine in yonder that's never been cut out i'm thinking of raftin it over to the mill good idea if you won't it said a strange voice but you don't huey dunlevy turned stared came to his feet with a leap there at the edge of the trees his approach unheard stood the man whom nelly callahan had seen in the canoe he wore nothing but his ragged shirt the most essential half of a pair of overalls and canvas shoes short curly red hair crowned a face that was weather hardened humorous strong boned one glimpse sparkling gray eyes that could either laugh or glitter and a wide generous mouth dripping wet as he was the stranger showed bruises and a cut lip and a red streak ran across his half exposed chest if you could spare me a bite to eat young lady i'd appreciate it exclaimed the stranger genially did i scare you folks sorry my boat went down and i was washed ashore saw the smoke of your fire and came for it is that a fish mulligan i smell and if there's any left have pity on a starving man nelly with a smile at his laughing words turned to the big pot huey dunlevy regarded the stranger with a frown on his wide features where'd you come from who are ye callahan's my name said the stranger coming forward you're no island callahan said dunlevy promptly the other laughed no i haven't that honor but our ancestors were kings in ireland at the same time i don't go by that name either mostly folks call me hard rock hard rock callahan eh exclaimed the girl not liking the general aspect of huey dunlevy well i'm nelly callahan and this is my father's camp and you're welcome shake hands with huey dunlevy and make yourself comfortable i'll have this mulligan hot in a minute and coffee's all ready hard rock stepped forward and extended his hand dunlevy accepted it though not with any marked warmth and for an instant the two men measured each other what was that you said when you showed up demanded huey about me not owning this timber something like that i guess hard rock callahan laughed cheerfully i happen to own it myself oh coffee ready thanks miss callahan or if i may say so miss nelly i hate to use the name of callahan on the beavers too many other callahans here already he sat down turned his back to the scowling indeterminate huey and sipped the hot coffee nelly callahan did not smile however as she put the mulligan pot in the embers it had come to her that while she was crossing the point this man must have worked his canoe into the shore have dragged it up and have made camp and what was this story about owning the timber you and me'll have to talk said huey dunlevy when you've had a bite to eat right said hard rock callahan 
i've had one or two talks already this morning the girl looked at him met his twinkling gray eyes and smiled despite herself end of chapter one chapter two of the arizona callahan by henry james o'brien bedford jones this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Chapter 2 Nelly Callahan saw that this man Hardrock was a stranger. And yet he was not a stranger. No one but a fool would have walked ashore on the beavers and claimed ownership of land unless he was known and accepted. For little good his law title would do him. Hardrock was certainly not a fool, however and at the same time he had some knowledge of the islands he had hidden his canoe and the stuff in it and it was significant that nelly did not look upon the story he told as a lie but as justifiable precaution was it his motor-boat that she had seen sinking and did ye say inquired hughie recalling the boat that your boat had gone down motor-boat and hard rock nodded in affirmation hit a sunken rock out yonder and raked her bottom out where from st james hughie scowled at that as well he might since no one but an islander was from st james and this man was no islander set in the middle of lake michigan inhabited by a hundred and fifty families each related to the others living by the loot of the lakes and woods the islanders were a clannish lot who clung together and let the world go by a few indians lingered a few outsiders had roamed in a few tourists came and went and over on high island was the colony of israelites silent wistful men with wide eyes and hairy lips no law was on the beavers nor even had been save when king strang established his brief mormon kingdom at st james there was not an officer in the group not a judge nor a lawyer nor a doctor and one man was as good as another and once when the revenue men came to pry around with talk of the eighteenth amendment there were dark tales of what happened by night but no more revenue men came as for game wardens they were not fools the beavers were not out of touch with the world however scarce a large boat on the western lakes but had from one to ten islanders aboard and the beaver gallagher's were known from buffalo to duluth how many island men lay at the bottom of whitefish bay it was hard to say some who made money spent the winters in chicago or elsewhere and bowery callahan who swung the island vote was state road inspector and traveled up and down the land enjoying his ease nelly looked at the two men by the fire and felt a sudden hurt in the heart of her for the smiling stranger he had no fear in his eye and under his brown throat his skin was white like ivory and his arms under their tattered sleeves were smooth as silk at him as he ate glared hughie dunlevy broad and dark like all the dunlevys rippling with great muscles a man with strength to toss a box of fish like a toy and many a tale was told of hughie on the lake boats and how he put the boots to any man who dared stand up to him now hard rock sighed and smiled at nelly and thanked her for his meal we'll have our talk said he to hughie and then i'll have a smoke i'm not so sure about that said hughie what are you doing here resting on my own land if you want to know i bought this end of the island from eddie john macaulay in charlevoix there was no parry between the two of them no hesitation Hard Rock looked Huey in the eye and gave him the news, straight and direct. Buying isn't keeping, said Huey. We'll have a word about that matter. 
Eddie John told us to take the timber if we wanted it, and take it we will. The gray eyes of Hard Rock glittered for a moment. Take it you won't, said he bluntly. Huey laughed, and it was a laugh to reach under the skin and sting. Is that so, Mr. Callahan? It's sorry I'd be to hurt ye, and you washed ashore and out of luck. So keep a civil tongue in your head. Have no such talk around Matt Big Mary. I warn ye, for this is his camp and mine, and he's a bad man in his anger. Hard Rock's thin lips twitched. So they said about Connie Dunlavy this morning in St. James. I hope he's not related to you. He came out on the dock to have a talk with me, and I think they're taking him over on the mailboat this afternoon to the hospital. Huey scrambled to his feet. Glory be! What have ye done to my brother Connie, ye red-haired outlander? Not a thing, said Hard Rock, and chuckled. Poor Connie fell off the dock. I think he broke a rib or two, and maybe his shoulder. Get up, cried Huey hoarsely, passion flaming in his face. So that's who marked ye up, eh? Then I'll finish the job. Hard Rock stretched himself and began to rise, lazily enough. Just then Nellie Callahan stepped forward. Don't, Huey, she exclaimed. It isn't fair. You mustn't. He's all worn out. Huey turned on her and shoved to her side. Out of this. Stand aside and see. He never finished the sentence, for Hard Rock was off the ground like a spring of steel, a billet of firewood in one hand, and the sound of the blow could be heard across the clearing. Struck behind the ear, Huey Dunleavy threw out his arms and went down in a heap. Hard Rock looked at Nellie Callahan, and the glitter of his eyes changed to a smile. So that's that, he said coolly. Too bad I had to use the stick, Miss Nellie, but you spoke the truth when you said I was done up. Don't worry about him. He'll come around after a bit. Do you suppose you could find me a bit of dry tobacco? Then we'll sit down and talk things over. For a moment the girl looked at him. She was blue of eye and black of hair, and the color was high in her cheeks. And when she smiled, there came a dimple on either side of her mouth, and her body held a spring of the foot and a supple grace of round lines that the school teaching hadn't taken out of her. Suddenly a laugh broke in her eyes. Huey had it coming, I think, said she, and turned, I'll get you the tobacco. She got him some and sat down at the fire and watched him stuff it into his pipe and light it with an ember. Huey Dunleavy lay where he had fallen. Father and the other boys will be back in an hour or sooner, she said. I think you'd better go and get that canoe of yours and be off while you have the chance. Hard Rock gave her a swift look, then chuckled. Oh, saw me land, did you? No, I'm not going, thanks. I'm staying. Then you'll have trouble, I'm afraid. He shrugged and lay back on one elbow, smoking contentedly. Very likely, Eddie John Macaulay thought he worked a smooth trick when he sold me this end of the island, timber and all. But I'd been warned beforehand. I spent the night at St. James and went up to the dance and had a grand time. Connie Dunleavy had too much moonshine, though and this morning he started to make trouble. Listen, please, said the girl, an urgent note in her voice. You can't take this seriously, but you must. You don't understand. You'll not be allowed to stay. After all that's happened, who was shooting out in the channel? What boat was that I saw sinking? Hard Rock took the pipe from his lips and regarded her for a moment. My dear Nellie, he said quietly, I'm afraid you're the one who doesn't understand. Did you ever hear of Danny Gallagher? Her eyes opened at that. Danny? Why, of course. His father, Vesty, owns the sawmill down at the head of the island. But Danny's been away two years in Arizona. And I've come from Arizona, said Hard Rock. 
that's where i got my nickname i've been running a mine out there and danny has been working with me he's a fine boy danny is he told me so much about the islands that i came up here when i got a year off and i'm going to settle down in a cabin here under the trees and finish writing a mining book for engineers danny has written his father about me i meant to look up bestie but haven't had a chance yet the troubled comprehension in the blue eyes of the girl deepened at this why didn't you do it first she broke out if people knew that danny had sent you here and vesty gallagher would answer for you there'd have been no trouble vesty is a big man on the island a word from him my dear girl i stand on my own feet said hard rock quietly the sunken boat you saw was mine two of connie's friends got after me i suppose they thought it was quite safe for the rain was coming down in sheets and one could scarcely see three hundred yards they ran me down before i knew what they were up to fortunately i had time to cut the canoe loose and get into her and then i opened up on the two rascals with my shotgun and gave them plenty never fear when i go over to st james i'll know em again and take a little punishment out of them for the loss of that motorboat satisfied are you under his twinkling gray eyes the girl laughed a little hold it he exclaimed oh no use gone again eh her gaze widened what those dimples how long is this camp to continue until the first of the week nelly callahan was disconcerted by his abrupt change of subject and forgot to resent the personality father's rounding up some cattle and counting how many there are here good then i'll be over to the dance next thursday night may i take you she was startled by his words she was more startled a moment later when a crushing of brush sounded and she leaped to her feet oh father's coming answer the question persisted hard rock quick yes she said and then turned swiftly to him go quickly nonsense hard rock puffed at his pipe nothing to get excited about i'm not going to start any trouble i promise you great scott is that your father he stared at the huge figure of matt big mary advancing upon him with the other two men following all three gaped at him matt astonished came to a halt what's this he rumbled huey where's huey lass who's yon man huey's gone to sleep said hard rock and came easily to his feet my name's callahan he's a friend of danny vesty gallagher broke in the girl swiftly from arizona and danny had him by this end of the island from eddie john macaulay father shipwrecked on my own land said hard rock laughing he held out his hand you're matt callahan matt big mary danny has told me about you glad to meet you matt gave him a huge grip between surprise and bewilderment what's all this brought it off eddie john you did and what do you mean by shipwrecked there's been no boat my motorboat went down said hard rock i got ashore with my duffel though got a camp down shore a piece come over from st james this morning oh and it's a friend of vesty gallagher e r a what's the matter with huey huey made a mistake hard rock grinned cheerfully he didn't believe that i had bought this bit of the island somehow huey and i didn't get along very well he had some queer idea that i ought to walk home and i didn't agree with him so he went to sleep i guess i'll be going drop over to my camp sometime i'll likely run in and see you again thanks for the coffee miss nelly and he was gone with a wave of his hand before the three astonished men knew what to say or do end of chapter two
Chapter Three of the Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Chapter Three. Hard Rock Callahan passed along the narrow sand strip that edged the north shore of Hog Island until he found a slight opening among the trees that suited him. Then he came back to his pulled up canoe and began to transport his load to the spot selected. The canoe itself he left hidden where it was. The storm was not clearing off, but was turning and bringing down a new and colder drift of rain and wind from the north. Axe in hand, Hard Rock attacked the tangle of dead and living trees that rimmed him in like a wall. For an hour he worked steadily, slowly driving back the growth and clearing the grassy sward that had attracted him. Then he dragged the debris to the shore and was rid of it. This done, he sat down in the wet sand, stuffed some of his own tobacco into his pipe, and sighed comfortably. What a girl, he observed, and she's the same one Danny Gallagher showed me the picture of, too. That's a coincidence. Well, I'd better get a shelter up before I settle down to dream about her. Good thing the motorboat went down instead of my canoe. She's a grade above most of the islanders that I've seen. Whether he referred to canoe or girl was not determined. He set to work methodically getting up the tent, which he now unlashed and anchored it securely. His clearing opened on the shore to the north, and the trees fully protected him from the eternal west winds. Since he was pitching the tent for all summer, he made a thorough job of it, and this took time. Then, opening up some of his bundles, he produced flannel shirt and corduroys and other garments, and clothed himself in decency. Having already collected some dry wood from the thicket, he now built up a cheerful blaze and watched the wispy smoke whirl away in gray shreds down the wind. The afternoon was waning, and he was considering opening up some grub when a huge figure came into his vista of the shore, and Matt Big Mary was striding up to him. Greetings, exclaimed Hard Rock cordially. Come in out of the rain and toast your shins. The big man nodded solemnly, sat down beside Hard Rock in the tent opening, produced a black pipe and blacker tobacco, and lighted up. He sat for a little in silence, staring over the fire at the gray lake, with those deep-set, melancholy eyes of his. At length he removed the pipe from his lips and spoke. Huey tells me you bought the timber. Yes, it went with the land, said Eddie John. I've no use for it, except this tall pine right back of here. If you want the rest, you can have it. I don't, said Matt. You're none of the island Callahans. No, New York State. So are we, out of County Tyrone, all the same stock. Matt puffed over that for a while. He'd done a bad day's work, fallen foul of Huey Dunleavy. That's as may be, sooner him than you. Matt turned and swept Hard Rock with his slow gaze. Why? Because, and Hard Rock stretched himself out more comfortably, because I expect to marry your daughter. I don't like jokes, said Matt Big Mary. After a moment, not that kind. I'm not joking, said Hard Rock coolly. Danny Gallagher showed me a picture of her, and that's why I came here, partly. Now that I've seen her and talked with her, I know. I'm fair with you. If she's in love with nobody else, and I can win her, I'll do it. Hothead queer heart, said Matt, a gathering rumble in his tone. Hard Rock laughed. I'm safe enough. She's promised. By herself or by you? No matter. Huey Dunleavy marries her. 
No. Storm grew in Matt's eyes, and his big black beard bristled. Careful, me lad. The boys wanted to come over and have a talk with ye. But I set down me foot. I want no trouble. Without ye force it on me. I'll have no man making light talk of my girl, more particular, a stranger. It's not light talk, Matt. I mean every word of it, said Hardrock. And I'm not a good one to bluff, either. You fellows on the beavers, Matt, are all clannish, and you all stick together like burrs, and you throw a strong bluff. Why? Because you're all afraid of the big world. Let a better man walk in and whip one or two of you, and things are different. Besides, I have a friend or so, and I want to call on him, and I'll be no outcast. So think twice, Matt, before you lay down the law. Even while he spoke, Hardrock felt his words fruitless. Matt's mental horizon was too narrowed to comprehend him in the least. You take my advice, said Matt Big Mary after a moment. Be out of here before tomorrow night, me lad. You'll find a skiff on the shore, down to the bay. Want me to put you off my land, Matt? said Hardrock quietly. The other was so astonished that he turned his head and stared. What he saw in those hard, icy gray eyes held him silent. Hardrock continued. You seem to think, Matt, that I'm a boy to obey you. I'm not. I don't intend to put up a no trespass sign and keep folks off. But I'm not taking orders from you, and I'm not scared worth a damn. If you bring a fight to me, I'll meet you halfway every time. I've tried to be decent with you, because I want no trouble. Now I have to be in St. James tomorrow morning, and I'll expect you to see that my camp here isn't disturbed while I'm gone. You're square enough to keep your men away from it. Think things over. When I come back, I'll see you. If you've made up your mind to avoid trouble and meet me halfway, I'll be glad. If not, we'll settle things in a hurry. What do you say to that? Matt Big Mary laughed slowly. Aye, said he. That's fair, Hard Rock. But you'll not come back from the island, if what Huey did be telling us is so. Connie Dunlevy will be waiting for you, or his friends. So will Vesty Gallagher. Hard Rock grinned cheerfully. I'll be back tomorrow night or next day. Anything you want me to fetch with me, mail or grub? Matt stared at him a moment, then rose to his feet. Damned if I can make ye out, said he reflectively. So long, I'll answer that the boys don't touch your camp. He strode away and vanished along the shore. When daylight died, the storm was blown out, and the rollers were already going down. Hard Rock Callahan, after luxuriously dining on beans and biscuit and hot tea, smoked his pipe and watched the stars, then laid out his blankets and rolled up. He was asleep almost at once. It was two in the morning when he wakened, as he had set himself to do. A glance at his watch confirmed the hour. He dressed and went down to the shore. Everything was quiet, save for the wash of waves and the whisper of breeze in the trees overhead. Off to the northwest came the swift, clear flash of the garden shoal light, and further west the red flash from Squaw Island light glimmered over the horizon. Nodding, Hard Rock returned to his tent produced an electric torch, and for ten minutes poured over an unrolled chart of the island group. Then satisfied, he laced up the tent flap, turned to the shore, and went to where the wide lake-cruising canoe was laid up under the bushes. In ten minutes the light craft was standing out under the breeze, rounding the point, and holding south for Beaver Island and St. James. The dawn was breaking when he drew down toward the long and narrow harbor. 
Instead of holding for it, however, he went to the right of the unwinking red eye of the lighthouse, came to shore on the point amid the thick trees and half-ruined dwellings there, and drew up the canoe from sight. Hard Rock Callahan was learning caution. He set out afoot and presently came to the road that wound along the bay and was the artery of the straggling row of houses circling the bay shore for a mile or more and forming the town of St. James. The sun was rising upon a glorious day when he had passed down the length of the bay to the head and reached the hotel and the restaurant adjoining. The hotel was not yet alive for the day, but the island itself was astir, and the restaurant was open. Hard Rock went in and breakfasted leisurely by the help of Rosie McCafferty, who was waitress, cook, and proprietor, finding himself taken for an early tourist from the hotel out for the morning's fishing. He let it go at that. Hear any more about the boys who were shot up? he inquired casually. In the course of the meal, the response stupefied him. Glory be, and what more is there to hear? Except the name of the scoundrel had done it. Poor Marty Biddy Bassett, a grand boy he was, and only yesterday morning he was setting here before me. And Owen John will maybe get well, but the fever's on him, and it's no talkin' he'll do this long while. The doctor at the hotel is with him this blessed minute. Eh? Hard Rock stared at her. One of them's dead, you say? I didn't know that. Wasn't they picked up by the Danes and brought in last night? And poor Marty with a bullet through him, and two through Owen, and the both of them all peppered with birdshot as well, and the boat ruined with bullets. There she lays down to the booth dock this minute. Hard Rock laid a coin on the counter and went out. He stood staring down at the line of fish sheds and wharves across the road, feeling numb and unable to believe what he had heard. Dead? Yet he had certainly used no bullets. He had neither rifle nor pistol. Mechanically he crossed the road and walked through the soft, deep sand to the fish company's wharf. Red-haired Joe Boyle had just opened up the shed and was getting in some box parts to knock together. He flung Hard Rock a casual nod as the latter approached and went on about his business. The boat was not far to seek. She lay on the north side of the dock and Hard Rock stood gazing down at her. That she was the same which had run him down he saw at a glance. Not many of these boats were open craft, nearly all having a box-like shelter for engines and lifters and men. Across her weathered stern sheets was a pool of dried blackened blood, and the thwart by the engine carried another grim reminder. Fear clamped upon Hard Rock. Fear lest he be blamed for this affair. It seemed only too probable Whoever had done the murder, too, must have done it shortly after he himself had peppered the two men with his shotgun. The swift impulse seized on him to run while he could. Instead of running, however, he leaned over and jumped down into the boat. Up forward was a tangle of ropes and lines and life belts, and a colored object there caught his notice. He picked it up. It was a small pennant-shaped bit of canvas, painted half white, half black, attached to a stick that had broken short off. Moved by some instinct, certainly by no obvious reason, he pocketed it and climbed back to the wharf. Morning, said a voice, and he looked up to see a gnarled, red-whiskered man surveying him with an air of appraisal. Your name ain't Callahan, by any chance. Callahan it is, otherwise Hard Rock. Good, I've been looking for ye, said the other. I'm Vesty Gallagher, Danny's dad. Let's you and me go somewheres and go quick. 
Come on over to Dunleavy's shed. Good thing I seen ye, Hard Rock. Blamed good thing. Come on. End of chapter 3「Section Four of the Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Section Four. In the heavy, dank quiet of the shed where the big nets hung, Hard Rock sat smoking his pipe. His brain listened mechanically to the words of Vesty Gallagher. Yet other sounds were borne in upon him. The rattle of ice from the wharf, the slam of fish boxes tossed about, the eternal creaking of the great net frames as they swung and swung endlessly in the breeze and groaned futile protest. By luck I came to town last night for freight and remained over, said Vesty. And by luck I seen you this morning and knew ye for a stranger. I said a word or two last night, when there was talk about your scrap with Coddy Dunleavy, after the two boys was brought in. Some said you had done it. Did you see? Nobody knows what happened out there in the fog and rain, but there's plenty that intend to know. Eleven families of Bassets there on the island, and Marty Biddy did today. Not to mention Owen John with two bullets through him, and the fever bad on him, and he'll go over to the Charlevoix hospital on the mailboat. By luck, my boy Danny had been writing me, and I was looking for ye. Hard Rock nodded and turned to the gnarled man beside him. It was more than luck that I met you this morning, he said quietly. You don't know just how bad things look for me. Here's what happened. He told what had taken place the preceding day omitting no detail. They were not close enough for the shotgun to do much damage, he concluded. Where those bullets came from, I can't pretend to guess. Vesty Gallagher bit his pipe stem thoughtfully, watching Hard Rock from screwed up, sharp little eyes. You're straight, he said suddenly. I'm with ye. So that's settled. Now hark ye here, my lad. I'll have a word with the priest, and he'll have a word with the boys, and they'll go slow. But if I was you, I'd come back to the sawmill with me and spend a while there. Hard Rock smiled. Thanks, Vesty, but I can't do it. Surely there must be some way of telling who shot those two fellas. There's many would a like to do it, said old Gallagher. The two of them was a bad lot. Them and the Dunleavy boys hung together. You'll have trouble there. Connie Dunleavy and Huey will guess that you had a hand in the shootin', and they'll go for ye. Better you come down home with me, lad. Can't. Promised Matt Callahan I'd come back to Hog Island and settle matters with him. The gray eyes of Hard Rock twinkled. I said I'd put him off my land if he wasn't reasonable, and I'll do it. Glory be! Have ye been fightin' with Matt Big Mary? and I hear Huey's over there. Hard Rock related a version of his encounter on the island, a version which very tactfully omitted any mention of Nellie Callahan. Old Vesty chuckled and scratched his red whiskers, and then chuckled again. Praise be! It's fine to hear of someone who's got the guts to stand up to them Callahans, he exclaimed. Betwixt them, the Callahans and Dunleavy's have been running too high a hand and drinking too much of Jimmy Bassett's moonshine. What she come to town for? To find who it was had run me down and make him pay for my motorboat, said Hard Rock. But now I'll reconsider the program. It won't do to have everybody know what happened, or I'd be... You'd be shot so damned quick you'd never know what struck, said Vesty promptly. Word's been passed around that you're a revenuer, but I've put a stop to that. If Owen John does any talking before they take him to Charlevoix, he'll be able to tell what happened. But they say he's bad off. I suppose the sheriff will be over to investigate. Vesty sucked at his pipe a moment. Maybe, he said slowly, and maybe not. 
Depends on what story's told. This here is Beaver Island, my lad. Them fellies has had scraps with everybody. Injuns, Danes, Israelites, and Washington Island men. Last week they had a scrap with some fellies from Sheboygan that was robbing some nets. A wild bunch, them Sheboygan lads, fishing on other folks' ground and running whiskey in from Kennedy. What'll you do now? Go back to Hog Island, said Hard Rock. Do it, and if you have any regard for health, keep the peace with Matt Big Mary. I'll walk up the shore with ye. Left your canoe on the north point, you said. It'll do no harm to be seen walking with me. They left the shed and swung up to the road, and there Vesty hailed a man and halted Hard Rock to meet him. It's Tom Boyle Gallagher, me own cousin, and his boys run the freight boat, and he runs this store yonder. Hey, Tom, shake hands with Hard Rock Callahan. He's the felly who had a scrap with Connie Dunleavy yesterday morning. It's a friend of Danny's he is, and a friend of mine. And he's bought some land on Hog Island from Eddie John McCauley. Tom Gallagher grinned as he met Hard Rock's grip. Glad to meet ye. Another Callahan, eh? Glory be, but the fightin' Callahans are all over the world. I seen ye to the dance the other night. Here ye knock Connie clear off on the dock, eh? Good for him. Sorry I had any trouble, said Hard Rock. I want to spend the summer up there, and it seems like I got off to a bad start. More like a good start, and Tom chuckled. Drop into the store any time. It's glad to see you, I'll be. See you later, Vesty. The two men walked up the road together, meeting not a few folk. To more than one of these Vesty spoke, introducing Hard Rock with emphatic cordiality, stopping now for a word or two and again for a bit of talk, so that it was a good hour afterward when they approached the canoe. Hard Rock, who wanted to pick up a trout or whitefish on the way back, showed his trolling line to old Vesty, and had a word of advice as to tackle, and then Vesty gave him a word as to other things. Lay low, my lad. When news comes, I'll have Tom Boyle Gallagher's boy bring it to ye. Mickey, his name is. There's a few Gallagher's left on the island yet. Praise be, and any friend of Danny's is going to have a square deal. Be off with ye now, and good luck. Ten minutes later, with the canoe leaning over to the breeze as she drew out, Hard Rock was steering north and exchanging a last wave of the hand with Vesty Gallagher. Under the latter's optimistic influence and quick friendship, his stunned depression had quite evaporated. He was himself again, no longer hesitant or doubting, ready for whatever might happen. Blamed lucky thing I met him, he thought, as he let out his trolling line and settled down to steer for home. And I sure hope this wounded chap will open up and talk before long. Well, by gosh, I feel a heap better than I did. I think I'll drop in on Matt's camp. Ought to get there about noon. Going to marry Huey Dunleavy, is she? Not if I know it. Not, that is, unless she wants to. And I'll gamble she doesn't. With just the right amount of ballast to hold her head down, the canoe was a marble for speed, and Hard Rock Callahan, who had not spent all his life in Arizona, knew how to handle her. Thus it was not quite noon when he bore up for the North Point on Hog Island. In spite of the big whitefish that came to his line and set his knife to work and brought the gulls wheeling to pick up the offal, Hard Rock had plenty of time to reflect on his situation. He was not particularly given to reflection, but just now there was need of it. One man was dead. Another was badly wounded. By good fortune, no one knew of their encounter with Hard Rock Callahan, but that story was bound to come out. If the wounded man did not recover and could not give an account of the killing, investigation would probably fasten the blame on Hard Rock from circumstantial evidence. So far, suspicion was not directed at him, but it would come. 
These are slow-thinking people, and the law is probably slower to reach up here, he mused. So much the worse when the time for action comes. Looks like it's distinctly up to me to land the murderers, as a matter of self-protection, and a fat chance I have of doing it, since there was no mention of Connie Dunleavy being taken to the hospital. He's probably not so badly hurt as I thought. That gang is against me, sure. Hmm. Guess I'll take counsel with the young lady. She's got a level head. He held in for the strip of shore before Matt Big Mary's camp, and perceived that the updrawn boat was gone. As his canoe scraped on the sand, and he leaped ashore, Nellie Callahan appeared and waved her hand. "'Welcome back. Have you come for more coffee?' "'That and other things,' responded Hardrop cheerfully, holding up the whitefish. "'Anybody around?' "'They've all gone to finish pulling stakes, and won't be back until late,' said the girl. "'Did you have any trouble in town?' No, I met Vesty Gallagher, and we had quite a talk. Got any nails around here? If you have, let's get this fish on a slab, and we'll discuss the weather while it's browning. Searching the shore, he presently spied a slab of millwood, nailed the opened fish to it, spilled plenty of seasoning over the firm white flesh, and got the slab in position beside the fire. Then he sat down and lighted his pipe, and looked at Nellie Callahan who sat on the end of a log and darned a thick stocking. And presently he told her all that he had learned this morning in St. James. For a moment her face flashed white, and in the depths of her widened gaze he read alarm and swift fear and wild surmise. Then she was herself again, cool and steady, her blue eyes searching into him with unconcealed tenseness of interest and only her breath coming a little swifter to denote the startled heart that was in her. It seems impossible, she murmured. Oh, and when everyone learns of how you used your shotgun on them. Steady? Nobody knows that except you and Vesty, said Hardrock. Who'd believe me? They'd say I had a pistol or rifle and dropped it overboard after shooting the two men. And how do you know I hadn't, Nellie? How do you know I'm not lying? She looked at him steadily for a moment, meeting his gaze squarely. Then, how did Vesty know it? She said, and smiled a little. Don't be silly. Did you see any other boat around except theirs? Hard Rock shook his head. No, but that means nothing. I couldn't see far for the rain, and I was intent on them. They'd been following me, you know. If there's any clue to be gained, it's from you. From me? How? The shots. You said you heard shooting. Now I let off both barrels of my shotgun. No more. I did think I heard shots after that, but my sinking boat was making such a racket, the exhaust pipe was smashed when they ran me down and I was so infernally busy handling that canoe that I didn't notice them. You did. How many were there? You'd notice the difference between the bang of my shotgun and the crack of rifles, too. The girl nodded and lifted her eyes, stared straight toward the blue mass of Garden Island on the horizon. There must have been five or six shots, she said slowly, now I think of it, I believe that two did come some time earlier. That was what drew my attention. Yes, and the others were different. They sounded more like the deep crash of an automatic pistol than the sharp crack of a rifle. But how can that help you? I couldn't see what happened. I can't swear. You're not expected to, Hard Rock responded, and felt through his pockets for a match. The thing is to make sure of what you heard. Somebody else was out there. A third boat. He broke off sharply. From his pocket he drew a strange object. Then recognition came into his eyes as he stared at it. It was the pennant-shaped canvas he had taken from the boat at the booth dock. End of Section 4 Section 5 of The Arizona Callahan 
by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Chapter 5 That's funny, he exclaimed, staring at the scrap of canvas. The girl glanced at it, then gave him a puzzled look. Why? You know what it is? Of course. It's the little flag left flying from a fish trap to show its position. Oh, Hard Rock laughed and tossed it aside. I don't know what made me bring it. Found it lying in that boat this morning with a lot of other stuff. To his surprise, the girl's eyes dilated suddenly. Excitement leaped into her face. What boat? she demanded. Not. Yes, the one that ran me down. Why? Dropping her work, Nellie Callahan pounced on the bit of canvas and lifted blazing eyes. Don't you see? It explains everything. Can't you remember seeing that flag in the water just before they ran you down? Hard Rock stared at her, his gray eyes narrowed and glittering. Hmm. Blamed if I can see what it amounts to much. Come to think of it, I believe I did notice such a flag. Ran close to it. Not the same one, probably. Of course it was the same one, exclaimed the girl, excitedly. She was all animation. Don't you see? This flag is painted to denote ownership, so each man will know his own traps. We don't use them much around here. Don't need to. But the perch season is coming on, and fishermen from Charlevoix and Petoskey, and even Cheboygan who work around here, need to use marked traps. Now do you see? Huey Dunleavy and his friends have been fighting the men from outside who came in on their grounds. Well, Marty Biddy Bassett and Owen John, as soon as they ran you down, circled back to that fish trap and probably started to rob it. They broke off this flag so the owners wouldn't find the trap again. Hard Rock whistled, and then the owners came along and opened fire. Upon my word, Nellie, I believe you've struck it, and nobody noticed this flag lying in the boat last night. They stared at each other, until suddenly the girl broke into a tremulous laugh. So all you have to do is to find who uses this flag. Who does, then? I don't know. Any of the men would know, probably. Hmm. Vesti said that Huey and his friends had fought last with some Sheboygan men. He mentioned whiskey running. Yes, the girl flashed up indignantly. And you know what they say about us over on the mainland, that everybody on the beavers runs whiskey from Canada. It's not so. None of us do that. Jimmy Bassett, who's here with father, makes whiskey. That's true. But most of the time he's so crippled up with rheumatism that he can't fish and do any work. And it's the only way he has of supporting his family. So nobody else on Beaver makes whiskey, and nobody runs it from Canada. It's those Sheboygan men who run it, and they hide up on one of the islands here until they can sneak it into Edge Low over at Harbor Springs for the summer resorters to buy. And then everybody blames the Beaver men. Look after that fish, or it'll burn quick. It's in the fire. I'll get the coffee and bread. The girl was up and gone for her supplies. Hard Rock rescued the planked whitefish from the encroaching blaze, smiling to himself as he did so, over the utterance of the indignant Nellie. He could appreciate her point of view and could even sympathize with it. There was something whimsically, just about one half-crippled man, being allowed a monopoly on moonshine liquor by common consent for his support. Thank heaven, I'm no prohibition enforcer, reflected Hard Rock. I expect she's hit it right. However, as regards the runners who supply the resort towns from Mackinac to Traverse with booze, these islands are ideally located for that purpose, and the pretense of being honest fishermen, hmm, by Hemlock, I've got the answer to the whole thing, but not a word of it to her. No wonder these fellows opened fire and shot to kill when they saw their fish trap being robbed. But I'd better go mighty slow, 
until I'm sure there is nothing on which to hang any legal peg so far. Even though the girl's theory was right, even though he found the men who used this black and white flag, any accumulation of legal evidence as to the shooting was distinctly improbable. Hard Rock recognized this clearly. At the same time, he felt confident that he had hit upon one solution of the whole enigma, a solution which promised to be highly interesting, even more so than writing a textbook for mining engineers. Planked whitefish, fresh from the lake, and coffee, and thick bread, and over the bread the rich juice of the eternal mulligan, made this time from the white smallmouth bass that swam around the wreck down the shore. Thus the two dined together, not gracefully, but well, and by tacit consent avoided the matter of their early talk. Instead, Hard Rock spoke of Danny Gallagher and Arizona and the mines, and gradually fell silent, and brought the girl to speak of herself and her life downstate, where she had these two years taught school, and the world outside this narrow horizon of the beavers, two on an island together, and time was not. I stayed in St. James the other night for the dance, said Hard Rock, filling his pipe for the third time, hoping you were there. I knew you down in Arizona, you see. In Arizona? Her level blue eyes searched his face, perplexed. Sure, Danny Gallagher had some pictures that were sent him. One was of you standing on a wharf. Oh, exclaimed the girl. Why, Huey took that last summer. You haven't changed. How'd you like to see Arizona? She looked at him, met his gravely steady gaze, then sprang suddenly to her feet and stood looking out at the point. Hard Rock caught the deliberate thud-thud of an exhaust, then saw the big launch turning the point. He rose. Father's not in her. Yes, he's lying in the bow, she exclaimed. Huey Dunleavy, at the tiller of the launch, waved his hand to her and lifted his strong voice as the launch rounded in toward the sandy stretch. Come aboard, Nelly. Get anything you want to bring. Come quick. Your dad's hurt. The launch sputtered, her engine died, and she came to a halt with her nose on the sand a dozen feet from shore. The girl made a hesitant movement. Then Hard Rock caught her up in his arms and waded out to the launch. Dunleavy and the two other men took her from him. In the bow lay Matt Big Mary, eyes closed. "'Badly hurt?' asked Hard Rock, as his eyes met the hard gaze of Huey Dunleavy. "No." Knee dislocated, I guess. We'll run him home. Got caught in a line and fell over the engine. You been to St. James already? Yes, Hard Rock's gray eyes narrowed. You'll find news awaiting for you. Two of your friends shot up, one dead. Whiskey runners did it, someone said. Nobody knows for sure, though. Dunleavy looked startled, then waved his hand. All right. You've been having a good time here, I see, so long. When I come back, you'll be singing another tune. I'll expect you, said Hard Rock, and smiled. The engine sputtered into life. The launch was shoved out, circled in a wide arc, and headed south, with Nellie Callahan crouched over the figure of her father. Once she looked back, lifted an arm, waved it in farewell to the man on the shore, as though in token of an unquenched spirit. She's all right, said Hard Rock to himself, independent, not afraid of them. No need to worry about her, real woman all through. He turned to the deserted camp, got the dishes attended to, left everything shipshape, kicked out the fire embers, and then made his way through the brush along the point of land at the northwest tip of the island. Here where the bushes thinned out and the land ran out in little islets, he sank down under cover of the greenery, filled and lighted his pipe, and lay motionless, watching the empty waters to north and west and south. Safely tucked away in his pocket was a little black-and-white pennant of painted canvas. Now as he watched the sun glinting on the waves 
between the point and garden island where his motor boat had gone down he reconstructed in the light of his present knowledge what had taken place there yesterday morning he was quite certain now that he recalled seeing that little pennant of canvas sticking out from the water those two recklessly pursuing men from st james must have seen it also as they drove down upon him then when he had vanished in the rain to leeward when after his two shots they probably thought him dead or drowning they had put back for that fish trap flag why not because it marked a fish trap alone but because it marked something else of which they knew and drawing down upon that little flag had been a third craft unsuspected in the obscurity they broke off the flag were probably fishing up the trap when the other traps appeared and opened fire then what the chances are a thousand to one that the murderers didn't wait to get what they'd come for one doesn't shoot down a couple of men and then stick around long besides the flag was gone and there were heavy rollers running and the sheets of rain obscured everything they couldn't hope to find the trap again in all that muck they'd have to go away and come back in good weather when they might locate the spot by means of landmarks and bearings from shore therefore if my theory is correct if they're really whiskey runners and that little flag marked a stock of whiskey as well as a fish trap all i have to do is wait no boat has been up this way all morning either i'd have seen it or nelly would have seen it and remembered it conviction grew about him that he had the right steer by the tail fishermen would not apt to open deadly fire even if they caught another man robbing their traps but liquor runners take no chances again he was impressed with the absolute ideal situation of the islands many like that on which he now lay uninhabited east coast fishermen could bring in the stuff from the canadian side and plant it and go away again other fishermen from the adjacent mainland from the upper peninsula from the wisconsin shore could come and get it who would suspect and if any one did suspect as nelly callahan had said the island men would get the blame the beavers had a reputation for turbulency which was less justified than forced upon them the afternoon hours waned and the sun sank and nothing happened nothing broke the horizon save the blue green and white fishboat belonging to the three danes coming in from the north and heading for the settlement on garden island with a swarm of gulls wheeling and trailing behind her to tell of fish being gutted and nets being washed she vanished and hard rock rose stiffly went to his canoe and paddled around the point he sought his own camp and found it undisturbed as he rolled up in his blankets that evening it came to him that he had not yet settled matters with Matt Big Mary. Good thing, he murmured, but I wonder, was he worse hurt than they said? That yarn didn't sound very plausible about his falling over the engine. Hmm. Should have thought of that before. I don't like that fellow, Huey Dunleavy. No matter. Tomorrow's Sunday. I'll keep quiet and watch. Good night, Nellie Callahan, and pleasant dreams. He fell asleep, smiling. End of section 5section 6 of the Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Section 6 sunday on beaver island was theoretically a day of devotion not even the mail boat came out from charlevoix since there were no fish boxes to be transported it was a day for visiting for going to church down the highway three miles from st james for eating drinking and talking the only man on the island who went his way regardless was old cap and fallows who was a socialist and proud of it 
but as the old skipper had been here thirty years and was by this time related to every one else he was regarded with unusual tolerance a shining bad example of a godless old man happy in his iniquity and glorying in his lonesome politics also the cap'n was something of a doctor after a fashion he was in demand this sunday marty biddy bassett was dead and buried that day and owen john had gone to charlevoix on the mail-boat talking in his fever but making no sense but down the island by the old russian baron's farm lay matt big mary callahan with a hurt leg and a hurt head matt had been struck by a big pile and had fallen over the engine of the boat and would not walk again for two days so he had gone home to the farm and captain fellows was doctoring him with liniment and talk on the rights of man there was much to talk about and there was a gathering at the store all day long while out at jimmy bassett's farm the keg of white liquor grew lower every hour the bassetts and dunleavies were taking counsel here and there the older heads advising patience the younger heads listening to Huey Dunleavy and his brother Connie, who was badly bruised but not seriously hurt. Connie was two years younger than Huey, and if not so strong, was just as hard to kill. It was true enough that Vesty Gallagher spoke a word to the priest, and the priest, who was the only man obeyed by other men on Beaver Island, passed along the word. Thus it came about that Hard Rock Callahan was accepted as neither a revenue man nor an enemy, and his affair with the Dunleavy brothers was taken for what it was, a private matter. Huey Dunleavy heard of this, and moved cautiously and spoke softly, but with his brother, Connie, and four other lads, he was neither cautious nor soft. He and they gathered in Jimmy Bassett's kitchen that evening and went into the affair at length. Among the six of them, it was not hard to guess close to the truth. Connie Dunleavy knew that Marty Biddy and Owen John had gone out in the launch to catch Hardrock. Nobody else knew this, but he knew it, for he had sent them, and he knew that they, like himself, had been up and raising deviltry all that Thursday night, and, like himself, had been in liquor. There were no guns, he swore solemnly to Huey, and the other four. What would they be having guns for now? It was this felly, Ardrock, that had a shotgun anyhow, and likely carried a pistol. He told me, said Huey, stirring his hot one, that it was whiskey runners had shot up the lads. How do he know that? demanded Jimmy Bassett. If they sunk his boat and he shot him, it's hanging he needs. He told ye the tale of whiskey runners, Huey, for a blind. Most like he did, agreed Huey. We'll have no outlanders coming in here and murdering poor helpless lads like them. What story was told on the mainland about it? A cousin of the dead man spoke up, his face black and gloomy. It was told that they had put a box of cartridges into the stove by mistake. Irene Dunleavy is a nurse in the hospital yonder, and Owen John's father did go over with him, so there's no chance of Owen's talking to outside ears. Then the matter's up to us to settle. It is that... There'll be no officers poking their heads into the island. Huey sipped his hot one reflectively. They looked to him for leadership, and he was not backward in accepting the guidance. At the same time, he was not going to rush headlong into trouble. There had been altogether too much trouble of late, and any rash actions that would compel the law to make an investigation would make everybody on the islands irritated with Huey Dunleavy. We'll tend to him, said Huey. We'll give him a dose that'll send him away where he came from. 
I got a little score of my own to be settlin' with em. So I hear, said one, and there was a snicker. What did he hit you with, Huey? Blessed if I know, but he'll not do it again. You fellies, go easy with your talk now. We got other things to mind besides him. I'm going to cut loose every fish trap up and down the shores that ain't ours. And if we meet them Sheboygan and Manistique lads, we'll make em like it. That's the stuff, Yoey, came the chorus of affirmation. Now Jimmy Bassett spoke up, as he limped over to the stove and refilled the kettle. After church this morning, I was talking a bit with Matt Slarson. You know that little point where his wharf and fish heads are? on the Garden Island shore, up beyond his place. He was telling me that on Thursday morning, at the break of the storm, him and his boys were mending nets when they seen a strange boat off the island cruising about. Eh? Huey's eyes narrowed. What sort of boat was it? Green with a red stripe around the house. A stranger. Up from Ludington, maybe or one of them ports. It was no Sheboygan boat, that's certain. Well, and Huey stood up, it's time I was off, for I've a date. We'll go over to Hog Island tomorrow night and attend to the lad from Arizona. We'll take my big open boat that the resorters use for fishing parties. Jimmy, fetch a quart along to cheer us up. I'll have the boat ready as soon as it's dark. Then put lights aboard her, said Connie Dunleavy, for the Coast Guard's been raising hell with the lads who are carrying no lights. Huey laughed at that and swung away. It was little he cared for the Coast Guard. So with all this keeping the island busy and no boats putting out that Sunday and the wind in the east so the tourists could make up no fishing parties, there was none to notice the small launch that came drifting up the channel toward sunset, past the length of the island, with a man standing in her and waving his shirt as a signal for help. The Coast Guard might have seen her, but it was dark before she came within sight of the point. And then the channel current carried her out and on past Pissmire Island. She went on drifting up between Garden and Hog, and no lights on her, and not a soul knew of her being around. It was well they did not, for if they had seen her and had seen the man who was aboard her, there would have been some tall talk. It was Hard Rock Callahan who heard the man yell. Hard Rock had been down the island shore in his canoe that afternoon, having grown tired of waiting for boats that did not come, and had been pulling bass from around the wreck in Belmore Bay. He kept nothing under three pounds, and he had sixteen on his string when night came, and stayed to make it twenty. He was paddling up to the end of the island in the darkness when he heard a long shout, and then another one coming from the water, and started out to see who was there. When he sang out and got answered, he paddled out towards the launch. Engines broke down, and my gas has leaked out, called the man in the launch. I left Charlevoix this morning, and have been drifting up the channel all afternoon. Can you give me a lift? You bet, said Hard Rock, coming alongside. No oars aboard? Nary a sign. What you got there, a canoe? You can't pull the launch with that. You climb aboard and take my other paddle, said Hard Rock, and save your breath to work with. Got any grub? No? Then we'll get around to my camp and fry some of these bass, and in about an hour you won't give a cuss whether you get home tonight or not. The other laughed, transferred skillfully to the canoe, and after making fast a line to the launch, they set out. Neither man spoke, as they slowly worked the dragging launch ahead, got her around the point, and then down the north shore to Hard Rock's camp. 
here we are said hard rock as he headed in you might get some of those masks cleaned while i get the fire started and the skillet hot coffee too we can attend to your launch afterward better pull her up out of sight why queried the other man tell you later the two men observed a mutual reticence until half an hour afterward they were sitting down to their meal then the stranger who was a grizzled roughly dressed man with a pair of keen eyes above a draggled moustache grinned across the fire and put out his hand my name's Folsom, and i sure owe you a heap of thanks callahan's mine hard rock callahan as they gripped hard rock noticed that Folsom looked startled but no comment was exchanged both men were too hungry to indulge in needless talk not until the last scrap of bass was cleaned up and the coffee pot was empty and pipes were lighted did hard rock learn who his visitor was then Folsom puffed soberly eyed him for a moment and spoke hard rock i'm mighty sorry about all this looks to me like luck was playing hard for both of us you don't know what i came over here for i'm not a mind reader hard rock chuckled Folsom threw back his vest to show a badge pinned to his shirt i'm the sheriff of this county and the main reason i came over here today was to sort of pry around a bit you ain't an island man i know em all i knowed em for twenty years more or less reckon you've heard of the killin the other day hard rock nodded reflectively he liked this sheriff read the man for straight and square and unafraid none the less in the keen probing of his eyes he read danger yes heard about it yesterday in st james Folsom puffed spat into the fire and asked a question know anything about it despite the careless tone despite the offhand manner of the speaker hard rock sensed something beneath the surface he was astonished by the manner in which he had met Folsom, yet he was not astonished that the sheriff had appeared fiction to the contrary every abnormal detail of life in civilized communities involves a consequence for what we call civilization is simply the ways of men set in a groove and any departure from that groove brings investigation with this intangible flash of mind to mind with this singular feel that something unsaid lay behind that question hard rock considered briefly and then answered it in utmost frankness sheriff if i told you all i knew or thought about it the chances are that you'd arrest me Folsom gave him a glance and grinned i'd have a hell of a job doing it wouldn't i not to mention getting you off to jail hard rock broke into a laugh good for you here's what i know and he told what had happened to him since arriving on beaver island sheriff Folsom listened to the story without a word puffing as methodically after his pipe had smoked out as before he sat like an image of bronze giving no sign of what was passing in his mind with such a man hard rock was at his ease for he knew now that he might expect some measure of justice and not hasty jumping at conclusions for the sake of political prestige you got your nerve to tell me all this said Folsom, when he had finished hard rock knocked out his pipe and filled it anew no witnesses present besides i figure you as a square that's the hell of it i gotta be square all round you're under arrest for that shootin hard rock callahan eh hard rock stared for the sheriff had not moved an inch you're in earnest yep so far as it goes Folsom wiped his mustache and chuckled gotta do it i've been nosing around the hospital and heard that wounded man talking in his fever mentioned your name 
now i'm right well acquainted with the beavers too durned well acquainted to come over here on business without a posse unless i come alone these lads over here may have their faults but their men clear through if i come over alone i get a square deal if i come with a posse i'm liable to get most anything well now i come over to look you up and see what i could learn and from hearing your story looks like it's my duty to arrest you any law officer would have to do it on the evidence all right said hard rock whimsically then what you can't prove my story nope all i figure on is doing my duty and breaking square with all concern now you're arrested and charged with murder you're in my custody you and me understand each other i guess i don't believe for a minute that things ain't exactly as you told them to me and i figure to stay right here a spell and help you work em out let's see that there fish flag hard rock dived into the tent and looked up the bit of canvas in his heart he felt a queer sense of relief a dropping away of all oppression this officer was not to be feared he was under arrest and if nothing turned up he would have to stand trial and the evidence was bound to be bad yet Folsom was square and this counted for everything i'm mighty glad we met up he said as he came back to the fire and i reckon we do understand each other sheriff here's the flag know it the sheriff gave it a glance then laid it down yep belongs to johnson brothers of luddington but they ain't fished up around these parts ain't fished at all since last year sold out lock stock and barrel to some fellows from escanaba i heard who are carrying on the business now either those fellows are running nets up this way which i don't hardly think is so or else it's like you say they're running something else for bigger money suppose you and me go out early in your canoe and look for that fish trap eh you're on said hard rock cheerfully end of section six Section 7 of the Arizona Callahan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Brandon. The Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. Section 7 The boats went out Monday morning, went out early. They went out from St. James Harbor and from the scattered buildings on the other islands. Boats of Indians and white men, out to the fishing grounds where lacy gill nets and hidden trap nets and long bloater lines and other legal and illegal methods of obtaining the finny prey were put into effect. Boats bobbed here and there against the horizon of island or sea or reef and engines whirred as the lifters brought the nets aboard, while trout and whitefish and perch went tumbling down into the tubs. There was heavy work to be done, since the fish must all be cleaned and boxed, and into St. James to make that afternoon's mailboat. All that morning Hard Rock's canoe bobbed here and there off the end of Hog Island, with a drag out from bow to stern, countering back and forth, it was too shallow hereabout for the big fish, and the waters looked all deserted, with only a sparkling flash of gulls off the blue line that marked the north end of garden, to show that a boat was working there beneath the horizon. It was nearly three o'clock when at last they found the trap, and then only by accident, for one of the drags picked up the mooring line, and Hard Rock hauled the canoe along this until the dim mass of the trap itself was under the canoe Folsom came to his assistance since it was no light task to haul in the heavy lines without tipping the canoe and together they got it to the surface they could see perch in it 
and big bullheads from the mud bottom and one lordly yellow sunfish but no whiskey hold on exclaimed Folsom, who knew more about traps than hard rock hold her till i get a grip on that mooring line now let go and catch hold now they tugged at the line and bit by bit worked loose the anchor down below and after a time got it on the upheave hard rock was leaning far over on the line depending on sheriff Folsom to balance the canoe and giving his entire attention to the rope below him this came heaving up soggily from the depths and presently disclosed another line knotted around it and hanging straight down thought so came the exultant voice of Folsom. haul in on the short line now in another moment the end of this came into sight and showed a firmly lashed case of liquor hard rock glanced up over his shoulder want it aboard if we can get it yes no telling how many more cases there are but we'll have to leave em for the present we'll see what this is make sure of it looks to me like you needn't worry about that murder charge any more better move lively too looks like a boat is heading this way from beaver left my binoculars in camp so i can't tell much hard rock could not pause to look he got the box under the canoe then came the ticklish matter of swinging it aboard this was finally accomplished though at imminent danger of capsizing the frail craft then he straightened up for a look at the approaching boat it was still half a mile distant and bearing up between the islands as though heading for them better get it to shore said Folsom. i ain't anxious to be recognized around here until it's necessary the way things are now looks like we got some canadian club here all right we'll open her up and make sure set that extra paddle in the trap to mark her before we go hard rock nodded and made fast the paddle so that it floated on the line from which the whiskey case had been cut then he headed the canoe to the point and pushed her hard whether that boat was heading for them or not he meant to take no chances in ten minutes he was cutting through the shallows inside the point and was out of sight of the boat when they came to camp they speedily lifted the canoe ashore and in among the trees then Folsom, obtaining hard rock callahan's woods hatchet began to pry at the lid of the whiskey case are you tampering with evidence said hard rock chuckling who me i ain't no prohibition officer returned the sheriff dryly no sir i never voted for no prohibition but i am to do my duty first thing is to find out if this stuff is whiskey or not can't tell by the box can't tell by the label the only way is to taste it eh laughed hard rock all right i'm with you and we'll give expert testimony go to it we can't afford to make any mistakes that's sure the case opened Folsom produced a bottle unhurt by its immersion and attacked the cork when this was out he handed the bottle to his nominal prisoner let's have your verdict hard rock the latter tasted the contents and grimaced it's the stuff he returned handing back the bottle the sheriff promptly tilted it and held it tilted until his breath was gone then gasping he lowered it and replaced the cork gosh that's good he observed wished i could keep the whole bottle go ahead nope he slid it back in the case i could sort of ease my conscience by having an excuse for one drink to make certain what the stuff was and i sure made that drink a good one but any more'd be stealin evidence which i don't aim to do suppose you slip out to the shore and keep an eye on that there boat maybe she's the one we're lookin for i'll lay up out of sight till i see who it is smilin to himself at the old conceit of the sheriff whose regretful devotion to duty was indubitably sincere hard rock left the cover of the trees and returned to his clearing he was just in time to see the launch 
which they had observed come circling around the point and head in to his astonishment he saw the figure of nelly callahan standing in the bow while another figure aft was tending the engine the girl waved to him eagerly while her companion a young fellow no more than a boy shut off the engine and let the boat run until her nose touched the sand by the flush of excitement in the girl's face hard rock guessed that she carried news of some kind she jumped ashore then turned and waved her hand at the boy hard rock this is tom boyle gallagher's boy mickey vesty gallagher was sending him over to find you so i came along to bring the message myself i knew more about it than vesty did anyway because i heard huey dunlevy talking to father last night all right cut in hard rock wait just a minute will you come ashore mickey got any gasoline aboard ten gallon in the tank still said the boy grinning know anything about engines he knows all about them broke in the girl why i have a launch down the shore that i'd like to have him look over she's down by the clump of sumac mickey drawn up see if you can find the trouble will you we may have to put her into the water sure and mickey started off hard rock turned to the girl smiling excuse me for the interruption but i had a bit of news too and didn't want him to overhear now come and sit down and tell me what's on your mind they sat down together on a fallen log at the edge of the clearing and hard rock got his pipe alight two things said the girl or maybe three and she laughed first huey and some of his friends are coming over tonight i heard them tell father they meant to drive you away and send you back to arizona hard rock thinking of the sheriff among the trees broke into a hearty laugh go on he said after a minute go on what's next isn't that enough vestry got wind of it and sent mickey off to warn you there's no tellin what they'll do really it's nothing to laugh about it will be i promise you and hard rock chuckled not for them to laugh about though don't mention it to anyone for he doesn't want it known but sheriff fulsom is over there in the trees now it's his launch that is down the shore i picked him up last night he was drifting up the channel disabled and out of gas he and i are working on this business and we've already proved my ideas right by finding that fish trap and a case of whiskey with it there are other cases at the same spot probably she stared at him wide-eyed oh good she exclaimed and i don't forget that i owe the tip to you either he went on well what next huey thinks that you did the shooting but he isn't sure he told father that a strange launch had been seen around here a green boat with a red stripe running along the house a fish boat i thought right away it might be the one good for you nelly callahan i'll bet a dollar she's the one we're looking for any further news from the chap who went over to the hospital he's still between life and death they said looks bad well what else is on your mind she looked down at the sand stirred a branch of ground cedar with her foot colored faintly then her eyes directing and searching lifted suddenly to meet his gaze nothing hard rock frowned something you don't want to tell me you mean yes please don't ask for a moment hard rock looked into the troubled depths of her eyes and the answer came to him he remembered his talk with her father he could make a shrewd guess at about what that sort of a man would do and say to the girl all right i won't he said abruptly you remember what we were talking about when the boat came along and you had to jump in and go about arizona and you and danny's picture of you that's why i came up here to the beavers nelly now let's not have any discussion of the question i don't want to know what your father said and how he may have reported what i said to him 
the facts are that i came here because i had seen your picture and now that i've met you i'm going to stay here for a while i told your father so and it's nothing to be ashamed of here's mickey coming back so let's drop the subject until a better time i'll be taking you to the dance thursday night as the boys say what's the good word mickey the grease-smeared lad grinned widely ye can't run an engine without a spark can ye sure she's all right i've got some extra batteries here and can fix her up in no time but that won't fix the leaky gas tank hard rock looked at the boy's boat an open launch of no great size see here mickey could you run off some gas into that big tin can aboard your boat and siphon that into the carburetor and run my launch into the harbor if you can there's a ten dollar bill for you leave your boat here and i'll rent it until you get my tank soldered up you bet exclaimed the youth eagerly half an hour and i'll have her in shape you going back with me nelly yes and hurry up said the girl we don't want to be out all day and night between them hard rock and mickey got the sheriff's launch back into the water and the boy fell to work there was no occasion to construct a siphoning arrangement for he discovered that the leak lay in the piping connections and stopped it temporarily with some soap then he had run five gallons of gasoline into the tank and turned over the engine it functioned perfectly hop in nelly he sang out we'll get back for dark thank you for coming over dear girl said hard rock as he gave nelly a hand and helped her into the boat if i don't come around before then i'll see you thursday night good-bye and good luck good-bye she answered quietly then as the boat circled out from shore he saw her turn a laughing face and lift her fingers to her lips blowing him a kiss for a moment he stood astounded then a laugh broke out from him and a long shout i may not wait until thursday after that he called and she waved her hand in farewell then the launch was drawing around for the point and passed from sight sheriff Folsom appeared from the bushes and he regarded hard rock with twinkling eyes gosh you look right happy over something he commented dryly say this is a good job you done too got us a launch all shipshape they'll recognize my launch over to st james but no matter nobody'll see it till tomorrow anyway you heard what she told me demanded hard rock the sheriff nodded yep i don't know that boat but no matter she's our meat i reckon if she'll only come and pick up that shipment of case goods but what about them fellows coming over here tonight his shrewd gaze inspected hard rock gaily looks to me like you and dunleavy are bound to fight it out young fella hard rock chuckled we should worry about what happens tonight i'm your prisoner and if you don't protect me hello sheriff where are your binoculars get em gone with my launch darn ya why what are you looking at hard rock who was staring out to the northeast drew back from the shore looks to me like our boat see her green sure enough can't tell about the red stripe get back out of sight Folsom. here help run this launch up a little first move sharp they mustn't suspect anyone is here can you make her out yep that's her affirmed Folsom confidently go get your shotgun hard rock end of section seven Section 8 of the Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Section 8 The round ball of the sun was hanging low above the purple line of Garden Island in the west, and the breeze was down until there was hardly a ripple on the water. From cover of bushes along the point, hard rock and Folsom watched the green fish boat a red stripe running broadly around her spin past the point and round it 
and head for the floating paddle that marked the whiskey cache. She's fast, said the sheriff appraisingly. Built for the work. She came up from the south all right, followed the channel through past Gray's Reef, as though going to the straits, then cut straight west and headed here. She wasn't taking any chances by coming up past Beaver. What's your program? demanded Hard Rock. Get out in that launch and get quick. You got your shotgun. I've got my pistol. She'll let us come alongside and we'll grab her. That's all. No time to waste. You're my deputy. Swear. I swear, said Hard Rock and laughed making a prisoner into a deputy. Oh, hell, shove along. We've got to move fast. I aim to catch her with the goods. They hurried back along the shore and ran out the open launch. Folsom gave his automatic pistol to Hard Rock, took the shotgun, and scrambled into the bow. You tend the engine. We'll get him back here and put him through the third degree, separate. Don't say a word about the murder. Leave me to handle it. With pleasure. The engine spat and coughed and puffed, and presently they were slipping out past the long point. The green fish boat had halted at the fish trap. She was a boat of fair size, housed over except for foredeck, aft deck, and a narrow strip along the sides. The after deck of this house was wide open. Forward on each side were wide openings where the lifter brought in nets and fish. Just now, however, two men were at work forward in the bow, hauling in better prey than fish. Several cases were piled up, and they were getting another case aboard. A third man appeared in the stern, stared at the launch, and called to his companions. All three turned, watching her. Hard Rock headed as though to bear up past them for Beaver Island and waved his hand, to which they made no response. The man from aft had ducked out of sight, reappearing on the foredeck with the others. As Folsom was apparently at work on something and not interested, the whiskey runners evinced no alarm. Then when he was opposite their boat and a hundred feet distant, Hard Rock shoved the tiller hard down and swung in toward her. One of the three waved his arm and shouted, Get away! Sheer off! We don't want no visitors! Sheriff Folsom straightened up, pointed down, and shouted something indistinguishable. Hard Rock held on his course. Again the leader of the three waved them off, this time with added oaths. Folsom grinned. Got something to show ye! Look here, look at this. The sheriff leaned forward as though to drag something up to sight, then came up with the shotgun leveled. The other boat was now not thirty feet distant. Stand quiet and put your hands up. You're under arrest. Hands up, dern ya. The whiskey runners were caught entirely unawares. The boat, obviously an island boat, with only two men in her, had been unsuspected while to lakefarers any talk of arrest among the beavers was in itself ludicrous. There was nothing ludicrous about Folsom, or the way he handled his shotgun, however, and after one surprised oath, the astonished and dismayed trio put up their hands. Run her alongside, said the sheriff to Hard Rock. Then go aboard and disarm em. Go through her for guns. You three gents roost high and quiet, or I'll blow daylight into you. What's this for, anyhow? demanded the leader. He was a big, lantern-jawed fellow marked with a scar across his cheek. His two comrades were swarthy men, whom Hard Rock took to be Greeks or kindred foreigners. Who are you, holding us up this way? Sheriff! and Folsom put up one hand to display his star. All right, Hard Rock. As the two craft came into each other, Hard Rock jumped aboard the larger boat and made fast a line. The sight of the officer's badge had disconcerted the trio, and they offered only sullen curses. 
as he swiftly went through them from two of them he removed heavy automatics which he tossed into his own craft the third man was unarmed crawling through the forward opening of the deckhouse hard rock paused in surprise there was no lifter in sight no nets for aboard no fish under him was a pile of a dozen whiskey cases the white wood all brown and soggy with water which had evidently been picked up at some other point in the course of the afternoon a quick search sufficed to show that no rifles or other weapons were in evidence and he returned to the foredeck nothing aboard but whiskey sheriff and plenty of that he called they loaded another cache aboard before coming here right thoughtful of em said Folsom grimly and moved back into the stern after tossing the captured weapons ahead of him you three birds hop down into the bow here come along now and no talk can't we fix this up sheriff demanded the leader we got some money now i'll soak you for attempted bribery snapped Folsom. get down cursing anew the scar-faced leader got into the bow of the open launch and his two comrades followed him Folsom looked up at hard rock cast off that anchor in her bows and make sure the line's fast give her the length good holding ground here and she'll drift in toward the shore and set pretty no wind coming up tonight anyhow i got two pair of handcuffs at camp and when we get these birds fixed up and have supper we can figure what to do next the three birds looked decidedly unhappy the two greeks began to talk in their own language until the sheriff peremptorily shut them down hard rock meantime dumped the big anchor over the bows of the green fish boat watched the line run out until it drew taut and then climbed back into his own borrowed craft the sun was just sinking from sight back to camp he asked and Folsom nodded assent the engine started up and the boat circled out for the point the sheriff standing amidships with his shotgun ready the three prisoners crowded on the bow thwart showing no symptoms of putting up any fight however simplest thing on earth said Folsom calmly is to handcuff a gent with his arms around a sapling we'll do that with two of these birds and interview the third give em turn and turn about at it and we'll keep em at far separated trees and no supper make em talk better hungry as they were perhaps meant to do these words reached and stung the trio after a rapid-fire exchange of greek the leader turned around this ain't legal he exclaimed savagely you ain't got no warrant i got a shotgun said the sheriff a cold glint in his eyes and you'll taste it if you get gay so turn around there and set easy we ain't ready for you to talk yet a while the boat was around the point and heading in for the shore hard rock one hand on the tiller swept her directly in toward the clearing threw out the clutch and after a moment threw it into reverse with hardly a jar the prow of the boat came into the ground a couple of feet from shore weighted down as it was by the three prisoners now then ordered Folsom you birds hop out and draw her up don't any of you make a break or i'll pepper your hides the big leader with a growled oath obeyed the order there was no sand at the water's edge the beach being composed of small stones and further back ran into sand the two greeks likewise got out the leader took the prow each of the greeks seized the gunwale and they drew up the launch until the bow was on the shingle now you hard rock commanded the sheriff never mind the guns i'll tend to em run over to my pile of stuff and fetch the handcuffs will you sure hard rock stepped past the sheriff and jumped ashore at the same instant the big leader stooped and the two greeks 
shoved outward on the boat with all their power Folsom, caught unawares by the tremendous lurch of the boat lost his balance dropped the shotgun and reeled for an instant the leader hurled a chunk of rock that struck the staggering man squarely in the side of the head and sent him down like a shot the whole thing passed off swiftly neatly with incredible precision and accuracy even as hard rock whirled about from his spring Folsom was down and the launch was darting out twenty feet from shore then he found all three men on top of him one of the greeks came first and went sprawling in the water as hard rock's fist met his face the second greek lunged in from one side a knife in his hand and took a kick under the chin that laid him senseless but the leader was hurling himself forward and hard rock could not evade caught in a burly grip arms locked both men went down thrashing even then had matters been equal hard rock would have won out for with a twist he came up on top and rammed a fist into the scarred face but just then the first greek swung a stone that laid the man from arizona prostrate dazed and almost senseless from the blow hard rock keeled over and before he could recover he was pinned down under both opponents tie him up growled the leader and two minutes later hard rock was bound hand and foot while the greek stooped over his unconscious comrade and the burly leader stood laughing and panting he grinned down at hard rock so that's what we think of you and your blasted sheriff he declared we'll let him float to mackinac if he ain't dead by the time he gets back here we'll sure be on our way got a good camp here ain't you guess we'll get us a bite to eat or we bring up our boat and beat it for a little however the man had his hands full the groaning greek revived by his compatriot retrieved his knife and flung himself on the bound captive the leader interfered and the trees resounded to bellowed oaths and orders and imprecations hard rock helpless to move watched and listened grimly at length the arguments of the leader took effect and ye don't want to be the same damned fools you were before do ye concluded the wrathful leader we don't want to be trailed for murder leave him be we'll fix him so's he can't hurt us none and we won't murder him neither you may think you can pull a stunt like that more than once and get away with it but you can't how'd you know that there sheriff didn't want you for the other shootin hey the sullen greek acquiesced put away his knife and all three men stomped away up to the camp darkness was gathering upon the waters but hard rock no longer stared at the rapidly vanishing boat that was drifted off along the shore and towards the open lake those words of the leader were dinning in his brain he knew now who had shot those two boys from st james end of section eight Section 9 of the Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford Jones. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Brandon. Section 9 It was perhaps five minutes afterwards, while some tins of food were being opened, that the three whiskey runners realized they had committed an error. Their leader appeared to be Marks was the one who realized it most keenly he came down to the shore stared off in the gathering darkness at the boat now a mere speck in the dusk and cursed fervently the shotgun had gone into the lake and their pistols had all floated away with poor Folsom. hard rock chuckled you fellas turned me loose he offered and i'll show you where there's a boat laid up down the shore Marks turned away. You'll tell me more than that, for we're through with you. Shut up. 
the three gathered again about their food getting a fire lighted and in their clumsy ignorance of the woods heaving on fuel until the yellow flames were leaping high and far over such a fire any cookery was impossible and hard rock chuckled at their profane efforts to make coffee without getting the pot too hot to be handled he meantime while apparently motionless and helpless was in reality hard at work he lay half sitting against the log between fire and shore at the clearing's edge arms bound behind him he had been tied up with the first thing to hand bandana handkerchiefs produced by the greeks and had made the gratifying discovery that the material was old and would tear easily therefore he was tearing it against the log at his back and by the increasing looseness knew that his wrists were nearly free marx conferred at length with his companions who were obviously taking their orders from him and presently the two Greeks rose and stomped off into the darkness along the shore, going toward the point. Marx himself rolled a cigarette and came toward Hard Rock. If you're going to starve me, said the latter, you might at least starve me on a smoke. Look out, your friends don't get lost. Marx laughed easily. I'll get you some coffee and a smoke, he replied if you'll talk will you or shall i make you sure thing exclaimed hard rock it's a bargain and cut me loose not much retorted the other and went back to the fire where he poured out a tin cup of coffee hard rock seized the instant his arms came free swiftly he got his hand into his pocket thus far they had not searched him except for weapons and slid out his pocket knife his arms again in place behind him he opened a blade of the knife and waited one cut at his ankles and he would be free without that cut he dared to take no chances tempting as the occasion now was for marx now came back to him held the lukewarm coffee to his lips as he drank then gave him the cigarette and held the match to it sitting down and wiping sweat from his face for it was hot near that big fire the burly ruffian rolled himself another cigarette he was almost within arm's reach of hard rock yet the latter controlled himself until his feet were free he must attempt nothing now let's have it said marx i didn't want them two lard eaters to get wise what was it the sheriff wanted to give us the third degree about about the shooting you fellows pulled off last time you were here marx nodded a frown darkening his scarred features evidently he had anticipated this information ain't it hell how you can't make foreigners savvy anything he demanded to the astonishment of hard rock them two fellers have just one notion of fighting to take a gun and kill somebody i'll have to let him go I can't make him savvy that there's a dern sight more danger in a murder charge than in running liquor. You mean they're working for you? Yep. The blamed fools run on them beaver men the other day. Found them lifting the trap out yonder and riddled them. Then let him go. That's a fool Greek every time. I wasn't along, doggone it. I was in Escamba, sick that day and you can't get nothing on me i gotta stand by them fellers of course and get em away safe but i don't like it a mite this sort of killin is bad business hard rock laughed curtly what about the sheriff oh him he's a sheriff takin chances same with you deputy ain't it yep he ain't killed though he'll drift over in the channel and it'll get picked up by a barge. We'll run ye out to Gull Island and leave ye there with some grub. That's decent all round. A fight is one thing, and killin' is another thing. I've been running booze a year now, and never had a speck of trouble before this. Durn them hot headed Greeks. They've spoiled the best little game this side the Sioux. You're sure frank about it? 
said hard rock dryly why not i want you should understand it i ain't anxious to be followed up for a killin i didn't do bad enough to have my business busted up now i gotta land this cargo and then go somewhere else doggone it i hope they pass them immigration laws and do it quick a fellow can't make an honest livin no more the way these dern foreigners are everywhere hard rock broke out laughing marks surveyed him darkly ye may think it's funny but i don't it ain't the law so much neither it's these derned islanders they're all over the lakes them or their relations if they take the notion it was me responsible for the killin they'll drive me off the lakes that's what the man's viewpoint was irresistible and hard rock laughed the harder while mark sucked at his cigarette and glowered angrily then came the chug chug of a gas engine and a low call from the darkness slowly the shape of the green fish boat drifted in upon the shore and then halted as her bows hit the shallows ten feet from the beach they had to swim to get her anyhow exclaimed marks the dern fools needed a bath he rose and went past hard rock to the shore hey boys toss that anchor ashore so she won't drift off we'll get away pretty quick now hard rock moved his arm and the little point of the penknife flashed in the firelight as he slashed the bonds about his ankles he was free now but he must let them all get ashore his only chance against the three of them was to get their boat and leave them here it was a time for strategy rather than for fighting so at least he thought he was to discover his mistake very shortly the two greeks came ashore bearing a line it appeared they had cut loose the anchor rather than haul it in there ensued a furious storm of oaths from marx the two men became ugly and for a moment it looked as though a row were imminent then marx cooled down and told them to get some of the supplies from hard rock's tent aboard the boat all three passed up to the tent none of them observing that the captive was no longer bound this was the opportunity hard rock had been praying for and he gathered his muscles once he could shove out that boat and scramble aboard her he had everything in his hands he drew up his feet saw that the three men were busily engaged with his supplies and rose while he was in the very act of rising a voice boomed out among the trees at the clearing edge there's callahan and his whole crowd get em all lads take em hard rock was already springing for the water but a figure appeared and blocked him it was the figure of huey dunlevy instantly hard rock realized what had happened and cursed the luck that had brought the beaver lads here at this moment from the brush was going up a crash of feet and wild yells marks was bellowing the greeks were cursing and fighting beyond a question dunlevy thought that they were part of a gang under the direction of hard rock callahan there was no time for any explanations the man from arizona barely had a chance to check his leap for the water to spring back and gain balance when dunlevy was upon him with a roar of battle fury and a whirl of fists ye will murder poor lads will ye he yelled and struck hard rock ducked the blow and answered it with a smash to the wind that stopped huey dunlevy for an instant glancing around hard rock was aware of the three whiskey runners by the tent furiously engaged with four or five other men he and dunlevy were for the moment alone only a glance then he was driving at his opponent hoping still to get out and aboard the boat that hope seemed vain a wild swing caught hard rock under the jaw and knocked him ten feet away dunlevy was after him instantly leaping high in air to come down upon him boots first he came down only on the shingle however and the man from arizona evading a savage kick reached his feet and began to fight huey dunlevy gasped and grunted as the blows smashed into him 
while before him in the firelight danced that unhurt face with its blazing eyes and its furious unleashed anger for all his tremendous strength the islander helplessly gave ground was driven backward fists driving into him with relentless accuracy in vain he tried to grapple to kick to gouge each attempt failed and only drew upon him another terrific smash under the heart waned as he was by white liquor having great strength in place of stamina dunleavy could not stand up under this battering never once did hard rock strike for the face but drove in fists like hammers that pounded heart and stomach in fearful repetition on the other side of the fire one greek was thrashing over the ground with jimmy bassett pounding him into submission connie dunleavy was down trying to quench a knife slash that ran from shoulder to elbow the other three island men were battering marks who was badly hurt and groaning as he fought and the second greek whose knife flashed crimson in the firelight now marks gave way and came crashing down and the snarling greek reeled as a stone smashed into his face hard rock got home to the wind with one direct punch that sent Huey Dunleavy two steps backward and brought down his hands, drove in another that rocked him, and then set himself deliberately for the finish. His feet shifting perfectly to keep balance, he now put over a light tap to the mouth and then laughed. How'd you like it, Huey? Come and get it, boy. Come and get it. With a gasping bellow, of anguished fury the other obeyed rushed blindly into the blow that hard rock smashed in with full force a perfect solar plexus knockout dunleavy simply doubled up and rolled to the ground two leaps took hard rock to the boat as he splashed through the water wild yells chorused up behind him and he glanced around to see dark figures bounding after him he set himself against the heavy bow of the boat and shoved vainly. He could not budge her. Desperate, he gave up the attempt, and with a leap was dragging himself over her rail. Too late, they were upon him, three of them. That effort to shove her off had lost him his fighting chance. Mad with battle lust and moonshine whiskey, they dragged him back and bore him down all three hurtling in upon him bodily careless of his blows so that only they might land blows upon him slipping on the stones he lost balance went down was stomped into the knee-deep water that was all he knew for a time presently half strangled and exhausted hard rock came to himself again this time he found ankles and arms fast lashed by men who knew how to handle ropes beside him lay one of the greeks dark features masked by blood beaten senseless and bound the other greek lay further away muttering low curses hard rock realized that some terrible sound had dragged him to life and now it came once more a low scream of agony his head cleared slowly as he visualized the scene before him in the circle of firelight lay huey dunleavy still unconscious and by him sat his brother connie weak and white and rather drunk his arm all swathed in crimson bandages the other four men by the fire held the frantically struggling figure of marks and were shoving his feet into the red embers from the man broke another scream this time rising shrill with pain and horror quit it quit it i'll tell then talk you doomed murderer growled jimmy bassett pull him out and give him a drink to make him talk lads the groaning marks waited for no drink it was them greeks done it he cried desperately i wasn't along with them i tell you it was them too done it all right snapped bassett lurching a little as he glared down at the captive 
and what about this hard rock felly is he your boss i don't know him returned the unfortunate marks shove him in again lads mark screamed and twisted terribly no no yes he's my boss sure he is don't you fools know a man will swear anything under torture demanded hard rock furiously you're going too far here cut this business out Marx was hastily flung aside they all turned to stare at him connie dunlevy waving a bottle in his free hand gave a weak drunken laugh glory be he's awake burn the boots off him buys the four lurched over hard rock made one desperate effort to pierce through the liquor fumes to their fuddled brains hold on there boys you've got this thing all wrong these men are whiskey runners and they had captured me before you came along i was getting away jimmy bassett leaned over and struck him across the mouth heavily shut up with you and your lies well we know it's you that's the whiskey runner and behind all this deviltry so it was them greeks that done the killin was it well it was you behind it all and it's you we'll have a bit of fun wid the night up with him lads up and shove him in hard rock felt himself picked up the next instant with a wild yell the four men shoved him at the fire shoved his feet and legs into the heart of the blazing embers he made one frantic frightful effort kicked himself out of the flames rolled aside the four gripped him and lifted him again with a maudlin yell of glee all together now howled bassett one two end of chapter nine section ten of the arizona callahan by henry james o'brien bedford jones this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john brandon section ten as the shot rang out jimmy bassett jumped into the air then stood staring at his arm that dripped blood a voice struck on the silence a voice from the edge of the trees all right boys hands up all round sheriff Folsom talking and two guns to talk with first man moves gets a bullet in the leg that crisp business-like voice bit into their drunken senses like acid hard rock lay where they dropped him sheriff Folsom stepped forward into the circle of light a pistol in each hand and not one of the islanders moved after reaching upward cut loose that man hard rock and do it durn quick he's a deputy sheriff of this county if you want to know who he is cut him loose will he john move sharp one of the men stooped and fumbled with hard rock's bonds they were all struck silent and were held in a stupefaction of dismay and consternation by the appearance of Folsom, whom they all knew a sudden and terrible sanity crept upon them you boys are shovin a good thing too far continued Folsom. hard rock and me got them murderers and then they jumped us lucky i ain't as soft in the head as i look to be for a fact took me quite a spell to get ashore and come back here at that how are you hard rock all right said the latter getting to his feet you done some swift action getting out of that fire sure enough here take a gun and stretch yourself all right boys put your hands down i'm doing the talking for a spell remember that what's the matter with huey dunlevy i knocked him out and hard rock chuckled connie got knifed by one of these greeks badly slashed i think all right connie you go climb aboard that there launch and do it quick no talk jimmy bassett go with him we'll tend to your arm quick enough long's you can move your hand it ain't broke git the two men dazed obeyed the order and stumbled aboard the boat at the shore 
Folsom looked at the other three, grimly enough. Now I want you three boys for deputies. We got to take this whiskey boat over to Charlevoix and lock up these birds. Hard Rock, got any information to spill? The man from Arizona briefly recounted what Marx had told him about the murder by the Greeks. Folsom comprehended at once and nodded. All right, Willie John, I suppose you snuck up here in a boat and left her laying down the shore. Yes, said Willie John, rather sheepishly. She's down to Belmore Bay. All right, you three deputies take the prisoners and get aboard. I'll rustle up some handcuffs, if you rascals ain't lost them. Hard Rock, get aboard likewise. Hard Rock smiled. Sorry, Sheriff, can't be done. Eh? Folsom eyed him sharply. We gotta have your evidence. You'll get it. I'll come over on the mailboat tomorrow. Hard Rock motioned to the figure of Huey Dunleavy. I've got a little business to settle with this chap first. I may have to convince him a little more that I'm a better man. Then we'll have to get his launch and Mickey's boat back to St. James, and I have a very important errand there. Oh, Folsom broke into a grin. Oh, so that's it, eh? That Callahan girl, eh? Doggone you, Hard Rock. Here's luck to you. See you later, then. He went for his handcuffs. Hard Rock looked down at the slowly wakening Huey Dunleavy. Looks like that textbook for engineers is never going to get written, he murmured. Sure looks that way. I've got to convince this fellow. Then I've got to convince Matt Big Mary that I'm a good man to marry his daughter. And then I've got to convince the daughter of the same thing. But I guess an Arizona Callahan can do it, by gosh. And he grinned happily. End of chapter 10 The End End of Arizona Callahan by Henry James O'Brien Bedford-Jones